Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for joining us here. Are we? We're on. So, my name is Conal Finn, and I'm the chair of the Project Management Society. And thank you for joining us here this evening for our lecture with uh, John Kelly from the University of Limerick um, on next generation project management. I'm looking forward to hearing John speak um, on this subject. It's uh, very interesting and a topic that is up for for uh, a lot of debate as to where things are going in project management because we can see the the advent of the likes of lean agile project management Wh where is the next thing and what 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 are we be looking forwards towards in the area of project management um some house rules i suppose um in the event of a fire the emergency exits up the top on the door you came in or down the bottom and um, the green man or you can you can watch my my dust i'll be going out first <laughs> but um we normally ask you to turn off your phones, but uh, today John is to turn, turn on your phones, put on your Wi-Fi, and go to um, the username is cafe, and the password is engineers, all lowercase, 0513. I'm not exactly sure what that means now, but there's obviously, obviously we've got a, a, a secret up your, your sleeve on that one. Uh, I would also like to say that there is a risk management um, breakfast briefing that the uh, Project Management Society are running on the 18th of May from 8 till 9.30, and that will go out through to uh, all the attendees that have left their details, and also through to the Project Management Society uh, membership, um, membership. We also have uh, a CPD event coming up that Engineers Ireland are running, a CPD day on October the 6th, which will be um, three teams, uh, virtual teams, mentoring developed capabilities, and decarbonizing the, energy, uh, the economy and delivering inward investment, so that will also go up on the CPD events page. Without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to John Kelly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colin. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks very much for coming along to this evening's event. Uh, my name is John Kelly. I'm director at the Centre for Project Management at the University of Limerick. Um, <coughs> I've been there since 2001. Uh, before that, I, I worked as a civil engineer project manager in industry for about 15 years and uh, decided to take the leap into academia um, really because out of interest in terms of um, what I could see was going on in projects and I wanted to learn a little bit more about that and maybe I suppose shed some light in terms of um, you know how how projects are run and maybe um, hopefully improve performance levels in projects uh, for, in for the industry and, and across industry sectors. Um, <clears throat> this evening's event, I know it says next generation project management, but I do not have a crystal ball, I, I, you know, so I can't sort of look into the future. Um, but we, you know, before we get into it, we, you know, we, we, we might look at, I suppose, what has been happening in projects and, um, you know, both from the sort of practitioner industry perspective and also, you know, what the researchers are saying about it and, you know, can we sort of start joining up some of the thinking in terms of um, the direction that the, the, the discipline is going? So that's kind of, I suppose, in a broad sense, what I wanted to share with you this evening. Uh, I reckon about 30 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Right. Um, so we can take lots of Q and A afterwards. And the other thing is that there's a, a showcase arranged for stairs. So um, there's a, a few education providers um, in place ready to share uh, some of the things that they'd like to uh, or the, the, some of the, the offerings that they have in this in this space and um, you know be a good idea to go along and talk to them and maybe ask them some questions around your, your own plans in terms of your own development and project management as Colin said I didn't want you to turn off your phones <coughs> because I'm going to try something and now I'll stealing an idea from your conference last week, right? <laughs> um, which is, uh, which, um, it was Pat Lucy did it, right? So uh, what I want to do here is to get you to sign oh. into a website. Just again on the password, it is, the username is Cafe with a capital C. Password is engineered all lowercase 0513. 
the reason we're saying that is because it's shielded in here, so your the mobile phone coverage won't work. The engineers are making sure you can't take phone calls during a, during a lecture. No. Um, Stealing, stolen this idea from Pat last week. So if it doesn't work, uh, can we blame Pat as well for not working? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, you, I need you to go to kahoot.it. Apologies for the music. No, I wonder if we, we're killing that. There must be sound down here somewhere, is it? Right, so you go to that website and use that PIN number, 156212. So if you want to participate in this, you put your name in. I'm not going to be tracking, don't worry, I'm not going to be uh, singling people. And, and the other thing I didn't copy, Pat last week to give up so. <coughs> so we managed to get one person in that's pretty good <laughs> there's about 25 people in the room Three people I know. I'll leave it there for a minute. If it doesn't work, we'll just leave it. Okay. Um. The idea was that I was going to replicate some survey that was done or has been done as part of, uh, you know, you see these industry surveys going out all the time um, asking people questions about their projects and, you know, giving some insights in terms of the performance of their projects. So keep trying to get in there and I'll go back to it. If it's, if it's working, we'll try it. If not, we'll just, we'll just leave it, okay? Um, what I could do is I, if, if we got some contact details, I could uh, send you an email with a link to a survey and just ask you to, to populate that. Literally just two minutes to, to, to complete it. So here's what I want to talk about today. So we've got you know a number of major headings there. Let's look at project performance and let's track its performance in terms of what the industry is saying and are we getting any better? A fundamental question that, that we should concern us. Uh, I want to introduce the idea of um, you know challenging the way we think about projects. Uh, talk a little bit about standard methodologies and frameworks. Uh, also touch on different types of projects with the idea being that for, you know, it's not a one size fits all type of thing. You know, you, you may have standard methodologies and frameworks in place, but there is some level of adaptation as you go from one organization to another needed, depending on the type of projects that you're running. All right. Do we want to try this? Right. Yeah? Uh, okay, so the other Wi-Fi network is Wiz. And the password is engineers0711. You want to try that? Engineers. 0711, so I'll, there's no gaps or anything in that, no caps. <coughs> right, so let's get into it then. Uh, look, look, let's look at um, the first topic, which is in relation to project performance. And there's a lot of, lot of reports and industry and research being done over the years in terms, which is uh, you know, pointing towards, let's just say, less than satisfactory performance. Um, in terms of projects. Uh, this, this is taken from a, a textbook called uh, Mega Projects and Risk. 
there's a guy there, Bent Fliegberg, I don't know if you've ever come across him, he's, he's written quite a lot about large projects. Um, he continues to write and, and publish and also you know, have podcasts, um, giving, bringing this up to date. Things aren't changing significantly since 2003. Uh, he calls it the Project Paradox because performance level on mega projects is uh, problematic, and yet we continue to, you know, um, continue to do these mega projects. And of course, if the performance level on a mega project, mega projects are like, I think the threshold he gives it around a billion dollars, so billion dollar projects. So we don't have too many in Ireland, right? I haven't had over the years. But certainly across the globe, and he sort of ex he, he's, he's gathering data from these mega projects from all over the globe, and tracking performance and writing about it. And he's he's, he's got you know it's 2003 since he wrote it, this book, um, and he's still sort of getting mileage out of it, like because the the results aren't necessarily improving that much according to him. Uh, are there many people here from the construction industry? Hands up. Right, okay. Uh, some of the industry reports from the construction industry have gone, ba gone back even further than that. So you're looking at the Banwell report written in the 60s, right, was talking about project performance and, you know, was, was given signals back then that the sort of fragmented nature of how we do projects is problematic in terms of how performance levels in projects. And it was 30 years later that the Latham report came out same more or less the same thing. So there's a whole period there where, you know, wasn't necessarily a whole lot of progress made. And, you know, so there there are across different sectors. There's, I suppose, signals saying that mm, there is room for improvement. Right. <coughs> the P PwC do a global survey periodically. So again, this was 2014. I don't think they've done one since. Right, so two years ago, the latest one. But interesting in their summary sheet on the front, they show some some headlines going back to the report. So from 2004, 7, 12, 14, there's common themes appearing, right? In other words, estimating is still a problem, right? Um, changes to project scope continually causing problems for projects. Uh, you know, having adequate resources assigned to projects and so on. And what they're suggesting in terms of project performance improvement areas that we need to look at is optimize your portfolio to maximize return. Well, really what they're saying is making sure, make sure that you're working on the right project, right, that's going to deliver value back to the organization. Be flexible, change faster, right, so having a more um, uh, adaptive mindset when you're when you're doing your projects. Is anyone here working in Agile? Hands up. One person. Right. Um, Agile being sort of maybe the pure adaptive type of setup. The other end of the extreme is the more predictive mindset which is kind of been I suppose traditionally how we projects have been viewed. Um, but in every project there are need there is needs to be flexible and adaptive, whether you're doing in agile or not. Enable your people to deliver success. So that's pointing to the people that you have running your projects. You know, you need to develop their competencies to ensure that they're uh, equipped to actually run these projects. Connect the executive team to program delivery teams to get the change you want, and this is pointing to the relationship between those running the project and you know, the sponsor or executive level. Um, and if you're a project manager running your project and you don't know who your business sponsor is, you should find out. Because a lot of what happens within your project uh, are things that may, may affect your project are outside your control, but they are in the control of somebody who's at the executive level. And there's, there's plenty of people have written about this relationship between the sponsor and the project manager and ensuring that that relationship is, um, you know, I suppose working well. It doesn't mean the sponsor has to be involved in the day-to-day -day routine of projects, but there is a, a route or a, a, a conduit for the product manager and the team to the executive board um, to make decisions and so on. And the other thing they point to is measure and address harsh facts to maintain direction, to, to really understand 
performance levels on your project, right? Understand, um, track it, right? So, you know, um, lots of things happening in organizations, but they don't really know uh, just how well or otherwise their projects are performing. This is one thing that you need to set up <laughs> internally to try and, um, so you know, um, in terms of your project performance, whether it's um, um, performing well or not. This is the PMI's Pulse of the Profession Report 2016. And if you look at those plots there, you would be forgiven for thinking that we flatlined in projects back to 2012, right? So, um, you know, maybe CPR is needed here, right? Uh, and this is where I was going to try the survey. So let's see if, um, did anyone get in? One player, <laughs> still surviving. <laughs> Do you want to have another go? Or? Yeah. That was quiz engineer 0711. That's it, yeah. All right, here we're getting some somewhere. So five. As soon as I press start, nobody else is going to be allowed in. <laughs> we hit 10. We'll go, all right? All right, well, we're flying in now. All right, 14, 15. <coughs> all right, we'll try that. Question. There's nine questions. I'm not going to do them all in the one go here now, right? Um, but the first one question is, what is your highest third level qualification? So just get a little bit of profile of who, who we have in the room. Any qualification, not necessarily project management. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. Right, so most people at degree level, which you'd expect in the engineers, uh, quite a number of masters people, and a PhD in the room. All right, so next qu question: Have you any formal project management qualifications or certifications? So I, I sort of broadly into industry-based, and then cert de degree masters level. Unfortunately not, no. One of the limitations of this tool. And one, pick whichever one you want. All right, so, right, we've nobody at the upper end and we've a few people down at the cert diploma degree level. Okay, so that's interesting and it's so, right, so now the next thing I'm going to do is, do you see these results here, right, actually if I can go on, I think the next question will do it for me. No, this is in the wrong place. Answer this question for me, so what, what, why are you here basically? I meant to move this question to the end, but. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, <coughs> All right, here we're into looking at project performance. So think of the last project that you worked on. Has it met its goal and business intent of the project? So you either agree or disagree. So it's very simple, one or the other. So we got 10 to 5. So what's that make it? 60%. Uh, so going back to my, which is really the first one here. And that's pretty much um, in line with what we have here, isn't it? What about the next one? 
The last project I worked on was completed on time. <coughs> Agree or disagree? for improvement there. <laughs> <coughs> the last project I worked on was completed within original budget. Again, agree or disagree? Nine to six, slightly better. The last project I worked on experienced scope creep. This is uncontrolled scope changes. agree with the statement, yes. <coughs> and again, it's around the 60% mark. <laughs> if you're prepared to own up to this. Good. <laughs> All right. So there's, you can see from this here that we're probably tracking pretty close at, um, uh, but improve somewhat better than the complete disaster, right? Which is good, right? <coughs> um, but obviously the thing is, you know, and what will concern us as project managers as, and as educators and as trainers is, you know, performance level is, is sort of static by the looks of this. This is coming from a survey done by the PMI of their PMI members. So if you're a PMI member, you get this survey and you um, complete all the answers and this is the results coming back. <coughs> and what they're talking about in terms of how do we improve on this? look beyond technical skills. There's more to projects than just having the technical know-how to uh, come up with a plan and track to earn value and all these wonderful things, right? Um, <coughs> while they're important, uh, you need to look beyond them. You need to understand how your projects fit within the business needs of the organization, so there's a sort of alignment with strategy, and drive success with executive sponsors. So this is a back to the previous point where you are um, you have a working relationship, so there's sort of a governance around projects is allowing that, that, that relationship to develop <coughs> and that both sides understand their roles and responsibilities. One of the more interesting things to come from academia in, in recent times is this Rethinking Agenda, which, came, which was sort of launched um, over 10 years ago by a group of researchers in Manchester Business School, um, where they basically got funding to gather some like-minded people together and do some research on in, you know, exactly in this area <coughs> to try and understand a little bit more about the areas where improvement players uh, might lie in, in projects and you know what was coming back from the practitioners end is that, is that you know the things that are being taught aren't really enough because it doesn't really reflect exactly what's going on in projects. So, for example, project complexity is something that is often not fully understood or, um, you know, not taken account of when people are trying to run and coordinate and manage projects. Um, and this leads to challenges and, and difficulties. Understanding projects are, are essentially 
um, in dependent or reliant on social interactions between uh, companies and people and understanding what, how those processes work is often something that is not necessarily documented or tracked or, or um, uh, I suppose, understood in terms of the, the effect that it's, that's having on project performance. So we all know good project managers are the ones who are the ones who are in touch with everything that's going on, and they're the, you know they find it in their interest to talk to the right people and, and make sure that the, the the right people have the right information and so on. So it's that sort of interaction that needs to be nurtured within within projects. Focus on value, and I'll talk a little bit more about this <coughs> for because after all, projects are delivering business should be delivering business value, um, and you know where is that value? Low? Can we recognise it and, and work towards it? Challenges around how we conceptualise projects. Again, we'll, 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 we'll talk a little bit further about that. But you know, often what we do is oversimplify projects in our how we conceptualise them, and that in turn can lead to difficulties and, and add to the complexity of the project. So by trying to oversimplify things, we can we can make things more complex. And the other area of interest was in, in terms of, you know, scaling up the people in, 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 in running projects, providing the right level of instruction and support um, so that practitioners can actually uh, meet the demands of projects. These are the areas that, that they came up with and are continually um, doing some research and publishing on. Um, so if you want to track what's going on there, look up uh, Mark Winter, um, some of his, his publications, some of his colleagues. So moving on from that, basically what we're saying then is that, that performance levels, there is room for improvement. Okay. <clears throat> so we're talking about challenging the dominant par paradigm. We're really essentially saying that the, um, this idea that projects run in a straight line from beginning to end and run through a series of phases. Um, you know, we start out with a set of objectives where we set the budget, we set the time frame, we set the performance levels. And we we go in a direct straight line to the end of the project, and we deliver whatever at the end. Is an overly simplistic way of conceptualising projects, and often the timeline, you know, well, you know, projects will sort of drift around over and back, and progress will not necessarily go in a in a straight line, linear direction. I think everybody's familiar with that in terms of their own experience. You know, trying to set it up so that you can predict exactly what's going to happen right through to the end of the project has, has been unrealistic. So it's, it's trying to, you know, well, you know, if that's not the case, then what do we do, right? That's, that's, that's what the, the challenging, the, the, the dominant paradigm is, is coming from. And this is where the value perspective comes in, because when you start focusing on not the out, necessarily the outputs of the project in terms of time, cost, performance, and look beyond, well, what actually is happening here? What, what What's the project delivering? It should be delivering value and benefits, right? And you know who's responsible for tracking value and benefits? Is it the project manager, or is it the sponsor, or is it some group within the organisation? You know, it's often sort of, you know, the project managers are, are sort of landed with something to deliver. They deliver it, and then they you know they, they move on to the next thing. Uh, whereas you know it's actually post project when the benefits are accrued. So it's it's understanding that and having that mindset, which really is, you know, uh, project managers really need to understand why they're done in the first instance. Right? So it will come from the business case, so they'll often have a business case and a charter that to work to, but they really need to understand that and, um, and work with the business partner to ensure that what's going to be delivered is going to, to realise the benefits, hopefully. So, <coughs> you know, Again, this is sort of a, 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 a variation on that. The project world is in the bottom sort of contained box there where you've got resources, the project delivering outputs. The project then is sort of, you know, um, deliver some, something back to the organisation, which in turn should be gaining the benefit from the project um, that's been delivered. So when you're down, if you're a project manager, you're down in the implementation mindset. Are you really worried about what happens afterwards? Right, and that's that's where you know performance levels you find are going to be enhanced when you have the people in the project team 
who understand that connection. They're not necessarily responsible for it because it's um, it's after it's, pro it's after the project is delivered, but it's it's understanding the things, the decisions that they make when they're delivering the project could have an impact on what's happening post project. Uh, usually, what this turns out is uh, that you have, you know, post project reviews, right, um, which would um, basically be fed from the deliverables of the project, and you would have a, I suppose, from the outset, a clear understanding of where the value is in the project, and you're trying to, I suppose, track to see has that value been achieved. Um, and uh, you know, so there are various mechanisms that, that, that you can use that allow the project manager and the various stakeholders involved, you know, the, the owners, so to speak, to work together to figure out well, what are the critical success areas for the project, right? And how can we actually build into our designs and our solutions that are actually going to deliver to those critical success areas. Um, Michelle's here, you sort of talked about it in this sense, that before we get into the project, right, that we really understand the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, and this is, I can do this a lot, right? They, they, they really get into the, the, the mind or the, the, the mindset of the, the customer, representative of the customer who's going to be using the product. And so they they really sort of need do a lot of work in trying to figure out well, what's the problem we're trying to, to solve here, right? and that's essentially that's something that Michel Thierry's been writing about since 2000, even before that. When you start trying to fast track projects, right, you need to understand that there's there's interdependencies and there's relationships that 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 need to be minded as you're going through this, provided you're you've got a, a clear understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve that you'll be able to, to make sure the project's moving in the right direction. The theory is also referring to the fact that there is a, this, this is a connection between projects and programs to deliver value. So projects don't exist on an island, in isolation. There's other projects happening around the, the organization. And often these projects are related in some way, and it's understanding that relationship once you understand the problem the project is trying to resolve, you'll understand these other relationships with other subcomponents that are trying to solve that problem at program level. So it's um, this is sort of an iterative thing, you know, that you you, you go through a, a series of cycle from project to project in order to deliver program level objectives. And then I, I just pull this from the. Um, Society of American Value Engineers who've been around for some time and they've set a methodologies and standards and it's, it's actually working in the same space. It's trying to figure out what exactly the stakeholders are looking for and expectations, where the benefits for the stakeholder might, might lie and how are you actually going to achieve this, right? And that relationship between delivering benefits and expending resources is where the value is. So what you what you know what you're what you're doing is you're engaging with stakeholders from the outset to understand well what's the purpose of the project in the first instance and how are we actually going to achieve that. And a quick word on the social processes dimension. <coughs> and this is a, this is sort of a, the the reality of projects is that you might you know on the left there you have a a, a network. Right, a network of people, firms, organizations, business units, whatever, right, um, that are tied together in some way. And uh, like typically, if this this is th the arrangement on the left, there would be could be a, a set of contracts. Right? So you've got, you know, a client with a set of designers. You've got a maybe a main contractor, a whole bunch of subcontractors, and so on. Um, and you know that that there's formal relationships built in the project, which is creating a network. And in order to deliver the project, you know, you need to have interactions to take place outside that those network connections. Right? And it's understanding that the performance level in the projects is seriously enhanced when you start working those relationships, and allowing maybe some some. Um, 
a network to develop which is more direct towards the needs the are of the project as opposed to you know what's in in place and this is where the social processes comes in understanding those networks and the power of those networks in terms of delivering successful projects well that's um, a more recent area in terms of um, what's been explored in, 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 in terms of understanding networks. I mean, we've all seen networks, we've all been part of social networks. We understand, you know, that there are certain components within networks that, that have features and characteristics. This is in the project world as well. So in every project you have these networks and it's understanding the performance of projects and the relationship between the networks is an, is a, an interesting area. Right, quick word on standard metho methodology and frameworks. <coughs> right, if you're typically, you know, uh, you know the sort of the, the journey that, that organizations take might, might be to start out in terms of project management development, they need to figure out well, what approach suits us, what, what's our approach to, to delivering successful projects, and then work that up into detail, develop, develop some tools to support that, and then bring the staff along and, and, and get them to use it. I don't know if my survey is still going, is it? Here's a question. Last question. Are you still on, on stream, Larry? Oh, wait, no, I might have lost that. Oh, there's still some people there. Ten answers. Right, sorry, I've sort of jumped into that too quickly. Um, <clears throat> so we got some with a PMO in place, some who have standard practices in use um, in some areas, and then some who have a small group of people. Which tip typically, what 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 that would be is that there's maybe a small number of people who sort of got together and sort of figured out well, um, you know if we sort of develop a standard approach of building sort of a, a, a level of consistency even within that small group is a small step towards it um, and then you have got some who have uh, everybody doing their own thing right um, so you know where do you go if you've got this sort of um, if, you're, if you're not maybe using PMOs um, what do you do Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. PMOs are project management offices, which is like a central support unit within within the organisations. Which um, they, they're not necessarily. Well, it depends. PMOs have lots of different functions, right? Um, some some are really just there to um, develop the methodology and ensure that the the, the supports are there in place for ma project managers to run their projects. Typically, that, that that's that's what they would be there for. So you sort of define a PM approach at the outset, um, and the PMO will be part of, of developing that. Um, and again, it's 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 a uh, I suppose it's it's really depends on your own circumstances what your needs are with regards to that type of central support function. Um, and sometimes it's a case of well, we use it to get something up and running. But then maybe there's no longer a need for it to exist. Right? So that's often happens in organisations. <coughs> right. So typically, that's that's what um, uh, you know in terms of developing standard approaches. Uh, the other thing that the PMOs are central for is in, is developing um, a set of um, uh, governance procedures, right, and uh, it's clearly articulating and explaining roles and responsibilities for all um, those involved in projects. And this, you know, the relationship between the project manager and the sponsor, um, <coughs> you know, would evolve um, through a sort of a governance mechanisms that are in place. So, you know, certain meetings have to take place, or certain reporting procedures to be in place to. To ensure that the, the information is flowing in the, in the areas that it needs to flow in, um, having sort of this this standard or this this governance around your projects and programs provides a framework for um, for the project manager to make decisions, for the executive executive sponsor to make decisions, for the board level to make decisions, uh, and so on. It works towards consistency. So what you want, you know by 
moving away from the situation where everybody does their own thing to having the PMO aligning um, uh, or some unit organization aligning the way um, project management practices are developed or, or used within the organization, it brings a level of consistency which makes it easier then for you know, executive level to see what's actually happening on projects. And so on. The various standards that are out there, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. Um, <coughs> some of them address project needs, right? So the, the PMIs, PMBOK or the APM body of knowledge. Um, others then sort of addressing people needs, competency development frameworks. And then there's others focusing on organizations itself. So the organizations which are, um, you know, trying maybe to address this um, approach to projects and, um, you know, I suppose, look at the maturity level that they're at, where you know, get, a, get a sense of where you're at in terms of the, um, uh, the way you manage your projects and trying to enhance that level of consistency um, consistent of approach and then you know towards the upper end in terms of the maturity levels building this sort of whole continuous improvement idea in terms of how, how projects are done um, again this is just a sort of an indicative model which says that um, this doesn't happen overnight right you can from level one to level four in one big jump uh, usually it's done in steps and the other thing is not everybody needs to get up to the top level, depending on the nature of your organization and to the level, you know, is, is it, are, you, are you working in pure project-based organizations or is it some, some, some other format? Um, <coughs> so you find a lot of people in setting up the PMO, setting up their standard practices, setting up their standard frameworks, get to level three and maybe stay there, right? They don't necessarily fee feel they have to move beyond that. But at least understanding where you're at and how you can make improvement in these areas, that's where the maturity models are, are used, how they're used. Right, I had another question in my survey, but it obviously didn't work out. So um, it was really in relation to um, the different types of projects that, are, that you're working on, right? And again, this is sort of a, a, a fairly old reference back in '93, which defined projects in terms of the whether goals are well defined or not, and whether methods are well defined or not. So, on the bottom left, it's uh, you know clear goals, clear methods, engineering type projects, paint by numbers, um, lend themselves to detailed activity-based planning. Right. And at the other end of the extreme, where goals are not well defined, the method's not well defined, basically you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how you're gonna get there. Um, you've got sort of research projects or you've got organizational change projects. And you can see even, you know, that sort of two ends of the spectrum and that very different types of projects. And if you were try to use a you know a project methodology and framework to fit the bottom left in a bottom right, a top right project, you're doomed to failure. Right. What you find is that the in in the non bottom left projects is that there are more let's call them adaptive methodologies being used, where they're more flexible, um, uh, you know, open to accepting changes but tracking and controlling these changes um, the, the analogy there is that if you're in a research change type project it's a, there's a lot of fog around the place so you don't send people off in a quest going in different directions because everybody get, get, will get lost right it's small steps right and that's you know you, you've seen that I'm sure in projects where it makes more sense to chunk it a little bit into smaller chunks so that you can deliver uh, and make progress incremental progress um, and that's sort of the nature of it. The bottom right one then is sort of systems development, software development type projects, whereas, you know, methodologies don't change from project to project, right? But what they're trying to achieve isn't necessarily clear from the outset, 
Right. So again, you know, you'd probably see a lot of agile projects in that space. There's another sort of typology framework, which um, <coughs> I suppose what it what it reflects is that you know I just drew that on. I didn't didn't sort of um, wasn't trying to say that anybody's projects looks like that. But you probably find that that a lot of projects are close to that, right? Unless you're in the you know the high tech sector, in which case you know the this thing here would be over here somewhere, right? And um, you know, there's also there's a, there's a lot of pressure to deliver pro projects faster, right? So a lot of people are working on time-driven projects. Um, working on a time-driven project is different to working on a project that isn't overly concerned about delivering on time. Right? The focus is different. Um, so the pace has a, an influence in how we run projects. The complexity, we've talked about that, so it's very simple, straightforward assembly type projects to projects where they're a part of a system or to projects much more complex which are part of an array of multiple systems. Um, and then sort of the novelty factor, right? Um, how new is this type of project to the organization? Um, or is this something that we've done before and we're just, um, you know, in the same area? So you can see that, that you know, even profiling your projects like this it gives you a sense that different projects have different needs, and you know how do you actually accommodate that within your within your projects uh, frameworks and methods and practices. This uh, this model is uh, is sort of um, reflecting the the competency development profiles of project managers. So a lot of the um, you know project managers and their level of expertise, you know, the easy one to fix is the technical PM specialist competencies, right? They're easy to, to sort of, I suppose, pick up or teach or train people on, right? Um, the, the, the ones that take a little bit more time and are more maybe in terms of their, their experience and, and um, I suppose as they, as they develop as project managers, would be the business and behavioral competencies. So you find a lot of project managers early in their career are sort of down level one, level two, know all the technical stuff, right? It's when they get in to try and do the project to realize that there's a, you know, this project is part of a business. There's a sort of an awareness there that's needed. Um, so, you know, how does that fit? And then, you know, projects are done through people and relationships between people and how getting that work that relationship working, getting the team to perform, leading that team in difficult circumstances. Um, and th that's, that's sort of a, a set of competencies, it opens up a whole set of competencies that need to be developed in our project managers. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about technology. I'm sure that many people in the room know more about what technology does to support projects more so than, 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 than me. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, if you're looking at one end of the extreme where you've got people who are doing their own thing versus, you know, the other end of the extreme where you've got a whole full PMO in place and, and you know, standard practice being done across the organization, you're going to see different levels of usages of technology. And in the first instance, you know, you're going to find that maybe there's a project manager that has a particular way of doing projects and he's always using the basic templates, spreadsheets, that type of thing which is he's, he's, he's drawing out the information from uh, what he's observing on the project and producing some kind of a, a report that he knows the, what's going on in the project and be able to, to, to show to anybody who wants, who's interested, right? Um, so that like, you still have that, right? And then on the other end of the extreme, you've got you know, these more enterprise solutions where there's standard tools, templates, processes, built into the, the technology, um, workflows, um, easy access, all these things that are, are used to help the project managers do their job. And sometimes it's like, you know, when these things are being rolled out, uh, project managers look fearfully at them because they feel this is just going to create more bureaucratic work for them to populate things that, you know, 
they don't really see the value in. So the job of the PMO and the people in the PMO is to, to design these well so that they're actually designed to help project managers do their job and show how this is, you know, the purpose behind them and, um, uh, you know, that once they recognise that, they're going to get significant buy-in. Again, you're going to see there's various um, out there. I'm not going to promote any particular ones. There's lots of them there, but, you know, what what essentially they're doing is they you know from a sort of executive level, they're going to like this idea where they can get a sort of a snapshot view of all the projects, see which ones are the ones that are performing well, which are the ones that that need attention. So like there's a series of metrics that that are being used to to report at a high level, and you get a snapshot view of projects can can be very informative. And and once you're using this sort of integrative enterprise solutions, you can get that level of information relatively easily. Right, so we're going to wrap up here by just maybe having a quick look at um, what next. Uh, what you see there in the bottom is what the PMI are calling the talent triangle. Are there any PMI members here, apart from Niall, who's... Niall is the president of the Ireland chapter. And... Connell is the chairman of the Project Management Society. <laughs> <laughs> and there's someone over there, a member of the PMI as well. Have you seen this talent triangle stuff? Yeah. You know, so when you're reporting on, like in, in Engineers Ireland, if you're reporting on CPDs, right? In, in, in PMI, it's PDUs. But you're reporting on PDUs, you're sort of supposed to be addressing those three dimensions of that triangle. You know, developing your technical skill set, your leadership, professional behaviours, and your strategic business awareness. So whether you're going for a, a full-blown academic education program or you're more interested in, let's say, the practitioner um, uh, training type of intervention, ask the question, to what extent are they addressing these areas, right? Because it's, um, uh, it's where, I suppose, it, it's been recognised that it's it's what you know enable your project managers to be able to do projects in, 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 in the current sort of um, the type of projects that are being run, and you equip them with the with the, the necessary competencies or skills and competencies, and these are developed through um, lots of different you know ways. And one of them, you know, one of the things that's likely to be factored in is that you would get some formal um, intervention through training or, or education. In terms of performance improvement areas, you might see at an organisational level, um, tackling, tackling the project management maturity problem. In other words, moving away from the everybody doing their own thing to trying to bring a level of consistency across the organisation. Um, and you see, you know, lots of people are using PMOs to help them to do that. Clearly. In the sort of global world we live in, um, lots of projects have been done in a global setting. Is anybody would they regard, regard themselves as being working on global projects? A few people in the room, right? So you understand that in that kind of setting, which is often done in sort of virtual settings, uh, there are challenges with that, right? Um, there's you know lots of cultural issues that come into it as well. Understanding uh, the different um, uh, the ranges of possible cultures that are involved in the projects um, and you know trying to work your, your project or navigate your project through, through some of those challenges is a major challenge a lot of work being done in virtual teams um, and I see that Conan has or the, 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 the engineers are in a PM event coming up in October and I see they've got, is that the team is it? One of the themes is on virtual teams and uh, one of our colleagues, Parik Loden, is going to give a presentation on that. He's doing a lot of research in, in, on virtual teams. Um, so it's really a, a growth area in terms of performance. And if we can crack that one, it's... it's um Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Liz Lee Kelly. Well, you can have a virtual team. <laughs> a virtual team in the same building, you know, that's, that's, that, that does happen. Like. 
I go back to the theme about driving value through projects and programs and working with your stakeholders to capture exactly what they're looking for, understanding where the success areas are, and developing design solutions to address those. Um, and there are, lot, there are mechanisms and uh, tools, methodologies that are being developed and being used in that space. And uh, you know, I think that's that certainly has to be a, an area where projects are going to be lead to better performance. Managing portfolios, you know, realizing that that the benefits are delivered to not just single isolated projects, relationship to projects and programs and portfolios of programs and projects. And having that sort of a, a an enterprise wise view of all the projects that are going on, which ones, you know, and how they're actually delivering value to to, to the organization is a um, and tracking that, so tracking what's going on post-project in terms of post-project reviews and, and, and audits, that type of thing, to see where we ended up, did we deliver the value that we'd identified from, from earlier on. And I mentioned knowledge management in the sort of passed over somewhere here, right, sharing information and knowledge, you know, which is a knowledge management space. But the bigger problem is knowledge transfer. What we're finding is a lot of organizations have in place good knowledge management procedures or, you know, typically what people say is that they're capturing lessons from projects in some way. But how are we actually translating these into, um, you know, real learnings for people who are going from one project to another or, or new people coming behind? Um, and it, it's the knowledge transfer is the problem. It's, you know, while you have all this maybe knowledge database, Trying to codify it and, and, and getting in behind it is, is proving really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's back to the social interactions, right? Because you learn, like if you're, if you're sitting alongside somebody who has a lot of experience in a certain area, you're going to pick up a lot from them in, in, in watching and observing what they're doing. Um, <coughs> You know, a lot of organizations in recent times have probably watched their expertise walk out the door and speak, you know, a bunch of people retiring, maybe taking early retirement, these things that were going on, particularly in the public sector, it's been a massive problem. And, you know, how, so how do you actually transfer the knowledge before that happens, right? So it's, it's recognizing that there is things you can do now as part of projects, developing mentoring systems, um, which involve interactions, social interactions between those that have the knowledge versus those that don't have the knowledge, and trying to facilitate that. Um, that's that's certainly an area where I think there's potentially a, enormous improvement to be made or to be gained in terms of project performance. All right, uh, there are just some thoughts I'd like to share with you. Um, happy to take. Is there any comments that people might have? <laughs> we don't have a mic, so if somebody asks a question, I'm going to repeat the, the, the question um, so that, that this is actually being recorded. Any questions? What, what's behind the flatlining that you have, in your opinion? What's behind the flatlining question? Yeah. Um, it's, I suppose it's, it's going back to the earlier points I was making in terms of the, 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 uh, the level of understanding of the, the reality of projects isn't there, right? In other words, we're trying to maybe set projects up by, you know, estimating when we don't, we can't really give a definitive estimate, for example. Um, because the range of uncertainty at the at the feasibility stage of a project is so great, and we're trying to give a, a, an estimate for a budget or a time for a project at that point. It's just an example where, you know, the expectation what sponsors want to maybe hear or what, what business owners want to hear is how much is it going. They don't want to hear that there's a there's a there's a, there's a range of uncertainty here, right? In terms, of, you know, I can give you a number, but it's you know, oops, sorry, but it's a uh, it's got a, you know, it's within a range. 
Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that type of thinking in terms of trying to oversimplify projects is, um, I think, is actually one of the reasons why things haven't approved and moved on. Um, so you can, you can um, essentially <coughs> train people up in terms of, you know, good project planning and that type of thing, but understanding that the project is actually a little bit more complex than that and, 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 and factoring in that complexity into how to, how, what we're doing in terms of planning our projects is one of the areas where I think it's, um, it's falling short. Oversimplification, yeah, yeah, essentially. Any other questions? Just, um, Sorry, project management, Yeah. Um, well, I, I suppose it really depends on on what your your where your interests lie, right? Um, certainly there's a career in it, there's no doubt about it that there's a career in, in, in the um, management of projects, of management of multidisciplines, um, you know, collectively that have to deliver, um, you know, a, a project or implement a project. And from my own point of view, it's like I was working as a, a sort of, a, you know, in a more, quite a technical role, and I just you know, after a while, I just got a little bit bored of it, right? So I said, I look, I get maybe step back from that and see, well, let's get a wider perspective on, on what's going on in projects. So it's really back to, you know, I suppose in terms of your interests and where your interests lie. Some people, it doesn't suit them, you know, it doesn't suit them to take on that leap where they're now in charge of a group of people to, to have to work, um, you know, across disciplines and, um, you know, you need to, a certain skill set around that, and they're not comfortable with that. You know? A lot of technical people aren't comfortable with that. They would rather stick with the with the technical discipline that they've been trained in, and uh, and that's fine because they certainly have a role in the organisation as well. So it's really if you want to broaden your understanding of projects, and um, you know, I would say even a shift away from you know what you've been doing. Yeah, just like you can go, you can go anywhere with projects. You know, you can, you, like we've had lots of examples of people who take on our MSc, for example, <coughs> who are in that space where they're saying, right, I'm, I'm, I'm taking on what is essentially a, 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 a formal education program that's going to open doors for me into different industries or different types of roles. And um, well, I'd be careful with that, right? It's, it's, um, you know, <coughs> you know, you you do need to be. Like there are examples, I know there are examples of people who have done that, but they've done it through, um, you know, I suppose convincing people around them that they, they actually know a lot about the technical side of things as well, right? So they were able to speak the language um, and they would have worked hard at figuring that out as well, you know? So it is possible, but you have to remember that you're, there's a credibility thing when it goes into an organization or a project setting or a project context that you're may not necessarily be recognised that you have that expertise. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, many projects are subject to, to changes, <coughs> yes. external changes. Yeah. And they are bigger budgets over time for execution. When would a project like that be successful? Okay, I'll just repeat the question there, right? Um, because. Um, I'm not sure if the mic's picking that up. So essentially, projects are subject to change. Many projects are subject to change, and so uh, the question then is, you know, how can that how can that be a successful project? How could that project be successful? Yeah, if you increase the budget because yeah. of the change and your, your, your schedule. Yeah. So like, if you're missing the targets that you set at the outset, yeah. is that can that be a successful project? Of course it can, because it's delivering the benefits. Right, and it's the benefits that, that are the important thing. Provided the changes that are being made are directed towards <coughs> the benefits or the value that has been, has been identified um, as being important for the project. So there could be decisions made during the course of the project to say, well, actually, we can enhance value on this project by expending more resources or taking longer to do it 
because it's going to give an, uh, some some benefit back to the client. Now, it is a, it you know too often the f the the focus has been on that oversimplification of projects, the iron triangle people call it. You know, if we don't hit the iron triangle, our project has failed. Okay, so um, I think when you start taking the, the value perspective on it, then you will understand that projects can change and do change, but it's the one it's making sure that those changes are directed towards recognised value and benefits. Then you get a successful project. And you're Okay. Yes, sir. You started out uh, saying that um, PwC identified things like cost overruns in 50 to 100 percent of the cases, forecasts of uh, inaccuracy 20 to 70 percent of the time, bad estimates, etc. Can just a minute now stop there and go back the other way? This way? This one, yeah. Which of those two markets do you think is most associated with what PwC was talking about in point? Right, in terms of the, well, P PwC were getting at the relationships um, and the development of the relationships. <coughs> this is a formal mechanism. The, the one on the left is a formal, it's all, all this illustrating us is there's a series of contracts in, 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 an organ, in a project as big as that. Right, so there's about 30 players project that that's a those, each of those dots represents a, a an organization not an not an individual right um, it might be a representative from that organization what PwC you're getting at is that understand that the other thing happens right and how those mechanisms um, are allowed to happen and are facilitated is important if it's open season, right, and everybody's communicating or transferring information with everybody, then that can actually work against the project, which can be can be problematic. Too little is a problem, so it's kind of having the balance in between, and um, so that's that's that that's where I think they were getting it. Yeah. What you're saying is somewhere in between those two. No. Not necessarily. That's that. That's that. The one on the on the right is a reflection of. I think it's an advice giving network, for example, right? So there's lots of different networks. Could lead to a huge amount of additional cost. Because you've got no formal way of a variation, of managing a variation. Well, I think yes. I mean, to try and maintain a network of relationships which has everybody connected to everybody else mm -hmm. is just impossible. So it is inefficient to try and and. Um, uh, but but everybody's not ev is connected there. They're not all connected to each other, or not, right? So it's it's a it's not a full dense network. Yeah. 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 Yeah.